May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the more delicate tasks that I had to perform when I practiced as a lawyer was to explain to clients who considered that they were entirely in the right, and some of them even were, that they might not win their case if they pursued it all the way to trial before a judge. I would note to these people how judges were not infallible, how the impression of a case could change markedly depending on the way in which evidence came out, how the other party might pull a rabbit out of the hat, or, and I hope you aren't too shocked to hear that such things happen, that the clever lawyer acting on the other side might, with the help of smoke and mirrors, persuade the judge that two plus two equals five. Some litigants really struggled to take this point on board. They assumed, as perhaps many people assume, that judges in a liberal democracy with a functioning legal system can be depended upon to sniff out the truth and justice of a matter and make their determinations accordingly. The nature of human fallibility and the vagaries of an adversarial legal system mean that the reality is otherwise. Perhaps I should have explained to my clients that the conventional preface employed in referring to a judge against whose order one is appealing when drafting grounds of appeal is learned. And the more you call a judge learned in your submissions, the more you signaled to the appellate court that you were worried that the truth was exactly the opposite. That was not an unusual experience. Now the judge is one of those official characters of the time who make frequent cameo appearances in the gospels. Though his appearances are often short, the judge of the Gospels is usually rhetorically complex. What, for example, are we to make of the eponymous hero of the parable of the unjust judge in the 18th chapter of Luke's Gospel? Is he vicious because he's lazy and avowedly lacking in compassion? Or is he virtuous because he acts in such a way that, as we are told, the woman petitioner gets justice? Now, the judge in today's Gospel reading strikes me as similarly ambiguous. Judgment and the person who dispenses it here are presented as motifs of furious terror, not of peaceable justice. If you end up before the judge, you are sure to be punished. Now, of course, the background theme in the Beatitudes is that faith and grace are what save and liberate mankind so that those who are most humble and open in their readiness to receive grace are those who will benefit the most from it. Those who insist on justice will get it, but they delude themselves if they think that this will turn out to be either quite what they expect or a pleasant experience. So the judge emerges as the person who will give you what you deserve, but it turns out that that's not something you really want. You should be careful what you wish for. But this difficult and menacing picture of justice raises some interesting questions about what's demanded of the listener to the Sermon on the Mount. He's to leave his gift in the temple and go and be reconciled with his brother before returning to complete his offering. He is not only to agree with his adversary, but to do so quickly. But what standards is he to employ in reaching his agreement? Does reconciliation have anything to do with justice? given that justice looms threateningly in the background of the sermon as a rather misguided aspiration. I want to make three observations about the passage, and I'll leave it to you to decide what you think reconciliation means. The first observation concerns comfortableness. Many translations of verse 25 contain an interpolation. The person seeking reconciliation is to reach a quick agreement with his adversary on the way to court. The words to court actually don't feature in the authorized version, but they do in many others. But the Greek text contains no reference to a court, just the words ente hodo, translated as in the way in the authorized version that we heard. And I don't think it's to stretch the text too far to conclude that reconciliation is something which ought properly not just to happen in the way, but which should get in our way. If we aim to hive off reconciliation to comfortable times, manana, or comfortable places when I'm back on my own territory, or if we want to leave it to someone else to sort out, like a judge, we risk its eluding us altogether. 
true reconciliation is deeply uncomfortable, not just in terms of its content, but in the times and places in which it's encountered. If something doesn't feel like it's getting in your way, it's unlikely to be true reconciliation. And the peoples of South Africa and Northern Ireland can attest to how reconciliation keeps getting in the way. Second, given that appearing before the judge and having to pay back every penny, in other words, paying your debt or settling your account, is the consequence of not seeking out reconciliation, it follows that whatever reconciliation is, it's not a matter of justice in the sense of the debtor paying his dues. If that strikes you as good news, because perhaps you're understandably primed to see yourself as the sinner in any biblical story, the one seeking to do the right thing and make amends, don't get too excited. Remember that as often as not in life, you will be the accuser, quite often with a convinced sense of righteousness and entitlement regarding whatever the quarrel may be. The tricky news when you have that hat on is that reconciliation means forgiving debts owed to you, meeting in the middle and leaving entirely behind an arid legal question of who is right and who is wrong. It means running to meet your debtor like the father of the prodigal son, not waiting for submission and confession, but welcoming and loving and forgiving, entirely forgetting right and wrong and any notion of debt or credit. It's interesting that most of the translations of this passage, even the New International Version, use the word reconciliation to talk about the state which is aimed at. And I doubt the translation known as the message is often deployed at St. Clement's. Perhaps even this is its first appearance virtually. But in this regard, and I suspect in many others, it has something to teach us. For it says that the debtor seeks not reconciliation, but rather to quote, put things right. To me at least, this paints an easier picture of what it is that we're called to do. If you're like me, you'll find it easier to think of situations in your past in which you can say that you have, if not grandly reconciled, then at least you've managed to put something right, in the sense that is of making it bearable or livable in. Perhaps a well-judged gesture, a letter, a bouquet, an extended hand or a smile, or a joke at one's own expense are familiar examples from our own lives, our own memories, of how we can start to put things right. And perhaps that's all, or at least the difficult first step towards what, this sticky concept of reconciliation demands. If that's right, then righteousness and justice go out of the window. The third observation is this, reconciliation seems to be constructive. I don't simply mean in the colloquial sense of being worthwhile, of involving positive steps, but rather in the literal sense of being something upon which we build something else. Well, that might seem self-evident, but if you're like me, you'll be able to remember easily situations in your own life where you've met an adversary in the middle to make things right, but have then, out of weariness or embarrassment or an unacknowledged simmering sense of injustice and resentment, preferred to bury the whole affair under a mental layer of concrete. That is not constructive behaviour, but rather the opposite. In today's gospel, the man who's found reconciliation must return to the temple and finish making his gift. Worship and thanksgiving then make sense as part of an experience of life which is open to and conscious of flaws, of rifts and healing wounds. But they're not only that, worship and thanksgiving, indeed any real appreciation of the grace offered to us by God are built fundamentally upon those flaws and rifts and wounds. If they didn't exist, if we were without them, our worship and thanksgiving would be hollow and uninformed, intellectual games in which we conjecture what peace might look like without ever having to inhabit its messiness and beauty for ourselves, and thus to know something of what it really is. Reconciliation, to be reconciliation, necessarily involves forward movement into new life, into reconciled life leaving behind our debts and our sense of injustice and constructing a radical platform for what lies ahead.
whatever reconciliation means, and as I said at the start, I'll leave it for you to think about. It is what we are called to. Whatever it is, we can be sure that it's grimy and complicated and uncomfortable, but paradoxically, it's infinitely better than justice. After all, judge not, lest ye be judged. Amen.